Welcome to the Occult London podcast. This is a new podcast dedicated to exploring magic, myths, and the Kabbalah, as well as other topics. If you like the podcast, please write a review and rate us on iTunes or whatever platform you are listening to this on, as it will really help us to get this message out there. Also, be sure to visit our website at occultlondon.co.uk, where you can subscribe to the show. In today's episode, we will be continuing our discussion on some of the aspects of astrological magic with a discussion on some methods of using magical techniques to channel and also work with astrological forces. As mentioned in the previous episode, this is a very complicated subject requiring study and training and preferably the input of an expert. However, these are a few of my own personal thoughts on this matter. Also, in this episode, we're not going to be going into an introduction to the basic ideas of astrology, as there's plenty of books out there, so a certain level of knowledge is assumed. Before we begin, I wanted to address the issue that often comes up with our astrological chart or natal chart, um, that it's sort of like our fate and we have no control over it. Rather, it should be seen as conditions that we can work with to our advantage or energies that can teach us lessons. This is a mystery that we can learn about ourselves and also our connection to others. As Dion Fortune wrote, learn now the secret of the web that is woven between the light and the darkness, whose warp is life evolving in time and space and whose weft is spun of the lives of men. Behold, we arise with the dawn of time from the grey and misty seas, and with the dusk we sink into the western ocean, and the lives of a man are strung like pearls on the thread of his spirit, and never in his journey goes he alone, for that which is solitary is barren. And that's from The Sea Priestess by Dion Fortune. So although we feel separate, we are all connected on this earth and are all influenced by the planetary forces. And perhaps through deepening our understanding of these aspects, we can begin to pass through that gate of true knowledge, true understanding of ourselves, and come closer to that goal of the mystery schools, or Nothi Suton, know thyself. The astrologer Caitlin Coppock talks about this quite a lot on her blog, which is really well worth reading. And she talks about actively engaging with these forces to achieve a greater understanding of the self. And she says the following on her Sphere and Sundry blog. Astrology is not only something that gets done to and around us. It is something we can capture, unleash and perpetuate in our individual spheres according to our will, skill, and what would most benefit us. So how can we change our luck or our fortune or what our stars are doing to us with our will? Well, there's several methods of doing this, and in last week's episode we covered some of the non-magical techniques that authors such as Andrea Goetz, Astrological Remediation, have recommended in the past. However, in this episode, I wanted to focus more on actual magical methods. The basic way of working with astrological magic is effectively working within the boundaries of the natal chart of the person it is directed towards or the magician itself. As we discussed in the previous episode, there's different intervention techniques. However, the primary magical one um, would involve sort of magical elections which comes from the Latin electio, or choice, which indicates the correct astrological choice of time to boost certain planetary powers. These elections can get very complicated, and they can also be quite restrictive in some ways, as you're essentially electing an appropriate time to approach an spirit. So you could be waiting quite a long time for the right moment or the right window, when those planets are aligned, which can be you know, extremely rare over the course of the year. 
one of the main ways that magicians have traditionally worked magically with elections is through the creation of talismans or amulets that essentially channel the energies of the fixed star or the planet or planets that the magician wishes to channel for their purpose or desired result. We will be doing an episode on talismanic magic at some point. However, um, working with and creating talismans is really another way of performing uh, remedial work on oneself or for others. Talismanic magic following the traditional medieval um, type of system, so the sort of thing you see in Picatrix, etc., uh, and some of the grimoires. It's, it's quite complicate, complex, and it often does rely on a very good knowledge of specific elections. And this process is described by John Michael Greer and Christopher Warnock in their introduction to the to their translation of the Picatrix as follows. In the magic of the Picatrix, the sources of magical power are in the macrocosm rather than the microcosm. Power is native to the universe, not to the mage. Vast currents of created force, set in motion by the Godhead itself, cascade downward through multiple levels of being. They are refracted by the stars and planets like rays of light striking moving crystals and descend to the earth with greater or lesser force, depending on the complex geometries of astrological relationships. The magician is the one who knows how to catch these currents at the moments of their greatest power, store their energies in material objects appropriate to them, and direct those energies to carefully chosen ends. And that's a quote from John Michael Greer, Christopher Warnock's introduction to their translation of the Picatrix. So it's relatively easy to create a talisman. However, making one that works is a completely another matter. The basic theory behind an electional talismanic magic is based on the principle or the idea that the talisman's physical body, like our body, is a container that holds the essence of the spiritual forces it's trying to contain. Therefore, the moment of the talisman's birth is essential. So the moment a human being is born, for instance, their astrology, the time, the place, would define aspects of their personality and their fate, their career. So the ascendant would show how they might act in the world. The moon their unconscious, their hidden side, the sun, the true inner self, and the higher genius, or the connection to the holy guardian angel. This theory, however, does not just apply to people, but it also applies to magical objects. So if we were making a planetary talisman, it would need to be born on a specific day, at a specific time, at a time when the positive aspects of the planet we are working with would be at their peak. The basic technique for elections with regards to talismans, uh, particularly basic ones, be, would be that you would you'd want the planet you're going to be working with be unafflicted and dignified, the moon to be unafflicted as well, and the planet that you want to focus on, for example Venus, um, be rising or culminating in its hour. There's a lot more complicated ways of doing it, however it can be very difficult to find a time that meets all of the criteria Um, so for example if you read some of the kind of medieval grimoires they require extremely unique timings which might be very rare Um, and if you needed to do something important um, urgently you might need to kind of uh, compromise a little bit in terms of the talismanic creation process so once the correct time and date have been chosen using the correct astrological date time for a specific location the magician would then incorporate designs and images and symbols that correspond with the talisman and also obviously with his intention then once the talisman has been created and it would usually be created at during the correct time and um, so you'd actually need to create it whilst that planet was um you know in a, in a good position it would then be consecrated And this process is described by Christopher Warnock as follows. We can begin making the talisman the moment these factors are all present 
and we should have completed the talisman and if possible also the consecration by the time any one of the factors ends which closes the astrological window of the election with very short time windows we may have to focus on just finishing the talisman and then at least begin the consecration ritual before the window closes so the, what he's kind of saying there is it's it's very important that we actually create it it's born during that uh, specific election but then with regards to consecration as long as we start it during that period then um, it's fine and that kind of backs up with my personal experience on that as well so in the above example um, you know one could create the talisman on a piece of paper at the appropriate hour color it according to the relevant planetary color and then you could move it back and forth through an incense that was relevant to that particular planet whilst reciting um, you know an appropriate prayer or an invocation so quite simple uh, consecration technique but does work there's also an interesting passage from Agrippa in his three books of occult philosophy that describes this process of, of how to create a fixed star rings that can be used for different types of fixed star and constellation talismans and Agrippa says the following now the manner of making these types of rings is this when any star ascends fortunately with the fortunate aspect or conjunction of the moon we must take a stone and herb that is under that star and fasten it under that star and make a ring of the metal that is suitable to this star and in it fasten the stone putting the herb or root under it not omitting the inscription of images names and characters and also the proper suffumigations and Marsilio Ficino who was a famous renaissance philosopher and magician also describes the making of a talisman of the constellation Ursa Major I planned to engrave a lodestone as best I could with the figure of the celestial bear when the moon was in one of her better aspects with Ursa Major as I mentioned the practice and art of elections is a very complicated subject and needs a lot of study to get it right uh, I would recommend the work of Christopher Warnock he does lots of different courses also Nina Griffin and uh, Caitlin Coppock are well worth looking into if you kind of want to sort of you know study more about um, that elections process so that's a little bit about elections and talismans but but what other methods are there for you know kind of connecting with these planetary powers and these astrological energies well there's a lot of other methods um, and some of them don't rely so much on timing and astrological elements and more focused on devotional one of these techniques is a technique known as propi propitiation which essentially involves giving prayers and offerings to planetary influences to gain their power the term propitiation is a term that is used in the catholic church quite a lot but it meant to appease or make offerings to a deity or a saint ideally to incur divine favor or also to avoid divine retribution or punishment one of this one example of a devotional approach would be using an orphic hymn with the planet and also burning an appropriate incense or a colored candle during the day or hour of the planet as we discussed in our episode on the different planets and the magical qualities there are well-known planetary days and hours for each of the planets some of which are really obvious so obviously sunday is the sun monday moon but then on top of that we also have each day from sunrise to sunset is divided by hours according to the planets so you could work with a specific planet depending on the day and the hour if you don't like the orphic hymns uh, the higromantia also has some really great prayers and hymns that can be used uh, particularly with these sort of planetary energies so for example the prayer of the sun goes as follows from the Higromantia in the name of the almighty and supreme god i conjure you lord sun the illuminator the king of all the stars the begetter of vision o sun who nurtures and causes the herbs and the trees to bear fruit 
who adorns the whole world with majesty, who banishes adversities in the darkness, who divides the beautiful things from the ugly ones. O sun, the embellishment of priceless things, the beauty and the majesty of pearls, gold and precious stones, the glory of the kings and the thoughts of the judges. I conjure you, sun, lord sun, inconceivable, incomprehensible, who sees the power of heaven and understands the splendours of the supreme God, I conjure you. Lord Sun, candle that burns before the dreadful god Sabayot, do not disobey me, I conjure you in your following names. And that's um, an extract from the Prayer to the Sun um, from the Higramentia. Also in the... Vedic astrological tradition you have uh, what is known as the Navagra mantras apologies if I pronounced that wrong which are basically auspicious hymns or mantras that act as uh, powerful healing tools really and are meant to really sort of stabilize the adverse effects of planets that may be affecting us from our horoscope and these should really be prescribed by an expert astrologer in the Vedic system depending on the time of day you were born, the location, and are meant to balance out the effects of the planets on the individual. We obviously discussed briefly some aspects of the talismanic work um, and also the use of the prayer devotional practices. Um, And going back to the talismans, there are some other options with regards to this as well. Obviously, we can buy a talisman. Um, There's various different places you can do this. I don't want to promote anything on here. um, But if you do decide to do this, then make sure you do your research properly. And also, you know, make sure that any reviews you read are genuine. You can also create a basic talisman out of talismanic materials. Um, There's lots of different methods to create talismans, ranging from... You know, extremely simple options to very complicated rituals. Um, one of the easiest options is where you would gather materials that are kind of connecting with that particular astrological or planetary energy. So it could be different oils, incenses, candles that correspond to the energy you're looking to attract. So, for example, Venus. Um, you would you'd get together lots of different uh, materials, the colour green. Um, etc that would connect with that planet and and just have them around you and the idea being that that would act as a beacon to attract the right energy to you the other option obviously um, you know there's different talismanic methods obviously the golden dawn had uh, their own specific um, method um, of doing kind of creating talismans that I've used successfully in the past um, where you would essentially kind of utilise different invoking or banishing elemental pentagrams um, and also the hexagram ritual as well with corresponding planetary hexagram symbols to invoke the specific planetary power and then use this to basically charge the magical material. The hexagram rituals of the Golden Dawn are um, very important from an astrological magical perspective and um, in the ritual all different variations of the hexagram ritual are drawn in different ways and directions um, to I essentially connect the magician with the macrocosm and specifically different planetary forces. The lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram is mentioned in many different texts and it's usually performed after the completion of the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram to neutralize any planetary energies before we then begin are working, uh, aiming to kind of align the will of the magician, who is the macroco- microcosm, with the macrocosm of the universe. The hexagram rituals use a different set of correspondences, really, um, for the directions than the LBRP. So if we look at the less banishing, which is the pentagram, it uses terrestrial order um, based on the seasons of the winds. The hexagram ritual, on the other hand, they use a celestial order that's based on the positions of the the zodiac. So instead of assigning air to the east, for example, 
the hexagram, in particular the lesser hexagram ritual, uses four different symbols which are variations of the hexagram drawn in the four quarters in which the pentagram is drawn. So you have east, south, west and north. And the ritual basically enables the magician to tap into elemental and astrological influxes simultaneously. And this really has a, a very powerful effect if anyone's practiced it. It raises the consciousness of the magician to that of the macrocosm. And it changes how we really perceive the world. So we stand in the position of the sun at the centre of the circle of Helios, surrounded by the belt of the zodiac. We perceive the cardinal sign of Aries, fire in the east. We then turn to the south and see Capricorn. We then go to the west and see Libra, and then finally Cancer in the north. In addition to the lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram, the Golden Dawn also developed the greater rituals of the hexagram that included, you know, specific invoking or banishing hexagrams as well. And they had different forms of these, essentially, um, which were attributed to different planets and different Sephiroth. And each angle of the hexagram could essentially be used to, as a device to essentially call up or dial up a specific planetary energy. So you had, uh, with the hexagram, the highest angle would be Saturn or Bina. The lowest angle would be Blue, Moon, Yesod. Then the right hand up would be Violet and Jupiter. So it's essentially like almost like a telephone in the, in the fact that you could use the hex, symbol of the hexagram and different ways of drawing it. You can actually draw in different planetary energies. And then obviously inside the hexagram, you can um, then trace the planetary glyph, uh, the zodiacal glyph, sorry. Um, and then it's tapping into the zodiac and also the planetary energy at the same time. And then obviously you would vibrate the divine name of the planet, the archangel, um, as well, which you know, all in all would kind of connect all of those together. Um, other options that are similar to the talismanic system would be things like the pentacle system of the Key of Solomon, where instead of spending hours on charts, the magician or the magical focus tends to be around purification of the self to produce a planetary seal of Solomon as a remedial tool. I'm not going to go into those in detail in this episode. Um, there's been some debate recently about whether these should be considered talismans in the strict sense of the word. Um, but yeah, jury's out on that one. Other approaches to working with, talis working with planetary energies would be performing service as well. This is something you see in quite a lot of different cultures uh, around the world. With service, one would either give a donation to a charity or perform a service to a person or a group that fits in with that desired sphere. So, for example, Venus could be anything related to love and animals and nature. Jupiter could be something related to giving and helping the needy you know, working in a food kitchen, for example, um, charity work. And this idea of service as an offering is common in many cultures. For example, there is a verse from the 17th century Prashna Marga text, which is a famous Hindu book of astrology that talks about this approach. And I quote, Kings and rich people should establish free hospitals. Ordinary people should at least give medicine and food to the sick. Then their sickness will disappear. The gift of health is the most important of all gifts. If anybody wants to be free from disease and be healthy, they should help the sick with food and medicines. So following on from that idea, you know, we can look at service for the different planetary aspects as, as follows. And these are just some ideas. So obviously the sun is very much kind of like this kingship um, centre of our universe. Um, so, you know, from that point of view, you could look at things like 
helping um, helping out with your father, for example, um, service to to your country or government, um, you know, donations to a local temple or a church. Obviously, the sun is connected with Tiferet, which is also connected to you know this idea of kind of religion as well. Um, obviously, the moon we could we could help our mother or a grandmother. Um, stuff that's in, involved with the feminine aspects um, could be dona- donating to a charity that helps women potentially also helping people with potentially uh, mental health problems would fall into that, that category as well or obviously anything to do with water so fish um, you know working with the ocean in some way tidying up the beach um, you know doing a bit of litter picking on your on the beach you know, all that type of thing would be relevant from that point of view. Jupiter, you know, this is Kesed on the, the Tree of Life, uh, very much about humanitarian work, um, charitable work, um, donations as well to, to teachers and spiritual organisations. Venus, the goddess of love, um, and Netzach on the Tree of Life. Um, and this could be something connected with relationships. So, you know, helping individuals get together, being a matchmaker, you know, supporting artistic or, um, you know, creative musical projects, things like that. Um, there's lots of ideas and, you know, I'm not going to go through all of them, but if there's a particular planetary energy that you feel kind of called to, to try and work with, this can be quite a good way of actually thinking about how am I going to work with that particular um, energy from my personal perspective what skills what experience do I have um, and you know can I balance that out <clears throat> um, other magical methods so obviously the tarot is another one that is is kind of quite relevant as well um, and you know we can use the tarot cards um, within a ritual setting by adding them onto an altar, which can aid with magical focus and meditation, and also connect us with um, astrological or zodiacal energies as well. They're very symbolic, they're very visual, so they can be much more useful than just using the glyphs of the astrological signs. And obviously with the major arcana, we have each of the planetary energies and also the zodiac energies um, connected to a specific card. So for example, Aries is the Emperor, Taurus is the Hierophant, Gemini the Lovers, etc. And you can easily incorporate these into a ceremonial element. So, for example, if you're doing a, a ritual connected with fire, you might want to include the Emperor card being a sort of cardinal symbol of fire from a zodiacal point of view. Obviously, if we're doing something for Venus for love, we could have a green candle on an altar with a copy of the Empress tarot card. And then you could combine that with an Orphic hymn to Venus and an invoking hexagram to Venus and then, you know, visualise your aura turning bright green and feeling that beautiful Venusian energy rushing through us. And, yeah, just it's just an extra symbolic thing that we can do that will really kind of can help us to tune in some of these energies. Um, other examples of practical work, can be some of the techniques that's recommended by Evo Dominguez in his excellent book on Practical Astrology for Witches. Um, and he talks about using zodiacal glyph symbols themselves, um, where we'd actually draw a symbol or combine them with other symbols in order to kind of tune different um, astrological or focused energies. And he talks about how they can be used to to add specific elemental energies or to link up with solstices and equinox as well. Um, and glyphs can be, as I said, combined. Um, so, you know, obviously he talks about if you had a big meeting or an interview, then you can combine the glyph of Mercury and Jupiter would be a good one. And potentially, you know, draw it invisibly on, um, you know, on your hand or it could be on a, on a piece of paper uh, as a kind of focal point one of the most important elements that we haven't talked about in terms of astrological magic is also the moon and working with the moon. 
The moon is that mysterious, that beautiful, silvery object that holds a huge fascination for mankind and is also considered to be one of the prime movers in our evolution and hugely important in magical work as the Italian astrologer Guido Bonatti wrote in his Anime Astrologia of the Moon. She of all the planets has greatest similitude and correspondence with inferior things. To pass by her daily effects, which she causes in all things here and the frequent revolutions about the elements and the elementary bodies, by reason of the nearness of her orb to the earth, and smaller circle than any other planet, so she seems a mediatrix between the superior and inferior bodies. Also in more modern times, the great magician Dion Fortune described the powers of the moon as follows. They hailed the sea as the oldest of created things, older even than the hills, and the mother of all the living. But they bade the sea remember that the moon is the giver of magnetic life, and that it was from the moonlight on the sea that living forms arose. For the sea is formless, but the magnetic moon is the giver of form to the life of the waters. Adoration or veneration of the moon has been a huge aspect of daily living around the world since the dawn of time, and the sacredness of the moon is very much connected with the rhythms of the universe and life, as it is these subtle, ephemeral rhythms that infect and influence all beings on the earth. But she also acts as a mediator between the earth and more superior and celestial bodies. The moon has also become hugely important in spiritual practices and cultures, as well as being full of rich symbolism, mythology and magic, both as a representative of emotional and magical power, but also deep karmic energy and energy as it is the closest planet to the earth is considered to have a huge massive influence on the planet. As the great magician William Gray wrote, the moon and magic have been inseparable from ancient times and there are endless spells and customs connected with the lunar influence on humanity. Some of these are still current in practical Kabbalah But the important philosophical principle concerned is that the moon is the reflector of the sun. No one can look directly at the sun without risking blindness, but the moon can be seen clearly enough. Thus it symbolises a quality of divine mercy in adapting the light of truth into more diffuse and softer rays which our human natures can comfortably bear. If we see the moon as a mediator, a go-between between between the earth and more superior and celestial bodies, or alternatively the microcosm and the macrocosm, this also fits from a Kabbalistic perspective, as if we think about ourselves in Malkut looking up at Yesod, the moon. Also, Yesod is known as the treasure house of images, and the foundation, and the home to the astral plane where much magic, be it pathworking or scrying or visualisation, takes place. Therefore it is hugely important. And some scholars have even theorised that the power of the moon is so great that they see celestial powers as being derived from the primal and the earthly and the moon, the four directions, the earth and the subterranean make up the original seven powers that were then later transferred to the planets. It should also be remembered that from the point of view that the moon was created when a Mars-sized planet is meant to have crashed into the original design, the original prototype of the Earth, turning the planet to vapour. And as the vapour begins to cool, a new planet began to form. A new planet that becomes the twin of the Earth, where it was believed in some cultures that the spirits of the dead lived. When the moon is growing in size, it is known as waxing, and when it is diminishing, it is waning. So if the magical task you want to accomplish is new stuff, beginnings, increase or growth, then the waxing moon is the best choice. 
if it's banishing, diminishing, or focused more on transformation, then the waning moon would be the best choice. As well as waxing and waning, however, the lunar cycle can be divided into four quarters or sections, each of which are part of the 28-day lunar cycle, during which the moon moves through the 12 signs of the zodiac. The first quarter of the moon is waxing, and we see a crescent of light on the right-hand side of the moon. And this is symbolised normally by the maiden and the huntress Artemis in her silver bow. Artemis is the protector of women and children, and also the patron of wild animals. The Roman equivalent of Artemis was Diana, who was the goddess of the first crescent. And this new moon is very much about planning long-term goals, but also planting seeds for the future, including creating magical tools. We then move into the second quarter, where the moon has grown halfway, and this is the second quarter and grows towards the full moon, and is associated with the image of the mother or a mature woman. The Greek goddess Selene is very much relevant to this particular phase, or the Roman goddess Luna. The full moon is about as powerful and magnificent as it gets, and it's said that the closer you are to the full moon, the more powerful a spell or ritual will be. And when the moon reaches its zenith at midnight, it sends down most of its magical power, and this is traditionally why the midnight hour is known as the witching hour. The full moon is also the best time to do magic that needs physical manifestation. We then move into the third quarter, and this is when it begins to wane, and this is the time to begin removing bad influences, illness, or also to do some protective work. We then go into the fourth quarter, which is associated with the crone. And this is normally associated with Hecate, um, other crone goddesses. Obviously, from a passable point of view, you can look at Kundri. It is the time of protective and banishment um, magic, so amulets. It must be remembered that talismans attract and amulets normally get rid of. Hecate is a particularly powerful goddess to work with uh, this particular phase of the moon as she is the goddess and mistress of magic, but also in her role as goddess of the crossroads and mediator of cosmic forces of the planets and the zodiac. And there's a beautiful hymn to Hecate, which is one of the Orphic hymns that goes as follows. Hecate, of the path I invoke thee, lovely lady of the triple crossroads, celestial, Chthonian, and marine one, lady of the saffron robe, sepulchral one, celebrating the Bacchic mysteries among the souls of the dead, daughter of Perses, lover of solitude, rejoicing in deer, nocturnal one, lady of the dogs, invincible queen, she of the cry of the beast, ungirt one, having an irresistible form, bull herder, keeper of the keys of all the universe, mistress, guide, bride, nurturer of youths, mountain wanderer, I pray thee, maiden, to be present at our hallowed rites of initiation, always bestowing thy graciousness upon the Bucolos. And that's the Orphic hymn to Hecate, which was translated by Adam Forrest. As well as the different moon phases waxing and waning, and also the quarters, we can also target this down even further by using a particular sign of the moon. So, for example, if we wanted some extra energy in a ritual, we might do it when the moon is in Aries, for example, to give more energy to a ritual, or if the ritual or spiritual work one was performing was more astral focused, then the moon in Pisces could be a good choice. Or also, if we were focused on more material wealth, stability or protection, then an earth sign such as Virgo or Capricorn could be a good choice. When working with the moon, it's also worth noting the position of the moon in daily magical diaries, as you will see that it does change the energy. And this can be particularly important with sort of daily meditation practices as well. We become more aware of the energies that are surrounding us, that are influencing us, if we make a note of, you know, the phase of the moon. And working out the astrological timing for when you do rituals can also be particularly effective and help to increase the power. And an easy way of thinking about rituals from this perspective is to look at the conditions of astrologically as a starting point. So if we're looking at doing a healing rite, for example, we could work best while the moon is waxing, particularly if we're focusing on, you know, sort of increasing health and wellness. 
whereas the moon waning could be more relevant if we're looking to kind of remove something, remove the course of disease. Also, if we had a job interview coming up and the moon was in Virgo, then you could increase the power of Virgo by creating a talisman or an amulet with the glyph of Virgo, as well as some relevant stones, plants, also the tarot card that's relevant to that particular um, zodiacal sign. Another element of lunar astrological magic is what is known as the mansions of the moon, or as they were known in Arabic, al-Manazil al-Kamar, the mansions or resting places of the moon. This is quite a complicated subject, so I'm not going to go into it in detail. However, in essence, it is based on the theory that just as the sun's motion through the zodiac marks the changes through the year, the moon changes throughout the night sky, mark the changes throughout the month so for this reason there was developed a zodiac based on the moon's position in relation to important star groupings that were known as the 28 lunar mansions and these have been observed in many different cultures including the middle east india and china these mansions are determined by the position of the moon as she circles the earth and were also used for timekeeping and magical work, with each mansion having its own characteristics, traits, effects and symbols, as well as almost like a diamond or kind of angel of that particular mansion. And these mansions would have been used in traditional, mainly sort of pre-1700 European astrology, also for electing appropriate times for different activities so for example the picatrix assigns different mansions for traveling uh, to the mansions of 1 5 11 13 and 21 and 28 and these times of the month were meant to help journeys long voyages and also keep the traveler safe so if we wanted to travel during um, the month we might select a time when the moon was in a beneficent mansion as well as important things like travel, the lunar mansions also have a full system of talismanic magic that is connect, contained in the Picatrix, where the magician would create different talismans according to the phase that the moon was in. For example, the second mansion, and I quote, The second mansion is Albertain and is for the removal of anger. When the moon is passing through this mansion, take white wax and mastic and melt them together over a fire. Then remove this from the fire and make the form of a crowned king. So fumigate it with lignum aloes and say, You, Enidel, drive away this anger from me and let me be reconciled with him and let my petition be satisfactory to him. Keep this image with you and it shall be done. Know that Enidel is the name of the lord of this mansion. As mentioned, we won't go into lunar mansions in depth but I just wanted to mention it in passing if people wanted to find out more. Um, I'd recommend the work of Christopher Warnock on his website, Renaissance Astrology, if people want to find out more about that. Um, he offers some really great courses and reading material on that subject as well. Timing is very important with regards to magic, and the important thing to remember is that we should aim to work with the conditions rather than against them and aim to meet them on their own terms. So if we're doing group work, one technique of doing this is to look up what the astrological conditions are before we start, and then we use them as inspiration for what we're planning to do. And this can also help us when we're sort of brainstorming about what we're going to plan to do, and also give us new ideas for how to work with the astrological atmosphere as well. So what we would do is we'd look up the sign and the phase of the moon, and then see if any planetary aspects at play, see if there's anything in retrograde, and then also look at the astrological atmosphere for that time and then you can kind of use that as an outline or um, a basis to come up with some ideas and this will sometimes work because you you know we're matching the energies that are in the air we're becoming more aware we're becoming more conscious of this macrocosm affecting the microcosm this can obviously be um, slightly tricky with with particular groups where you know lots of people have different diaries etc so in that situation, you you know you could look at the planets, the aspects and signs and see if any of the elements are emphasised. And then we could try and sort of tailor it as well. 
And also we can use the same principle to kind of add more power to lesser influences as well or balance out. Um, and this can be also be used if astrological conditions are bad so we can incorporate other elements from the wheel of the year. So for example, Ivo Dominguez um, talks about this in his Astrology for Witches book, which is I would recommend. And I quote, If your intended purpose requires growth and expansion that are not supported by the dominant conditions, but your ritual or working is occurring near dawn, then emphasise the rising of the sun in your plan of action. You may also wish to place your primary altar in the east, as it is the direction of spring and growth. Additionally, you could consider adding the glyph of Aries into some parts of the working. As another example, let's say you are having a ritual or working to commune with the ancestors and the conditions are not conducive to psychic sensitivity. Samhain or Halloween is the time when it is easiest to communicate with the dead and it occurs at the midway point between the fall equinox and the winter solstice. If the ritual or working will occur halfway between sunset and midnight, then you can call upon the power of Samhain. You may wish to place an altar in the northwest to anchor this place in the cycle. From a timing perspective, the equinoxes tend to be the best points for some of the more sort of powerful spiritual work as well, so it's always worth bearing that in mind. So that's a few ideas on how we can actively use magical techniques to balance out energies. Ultimately though, practical magic is about getting what you want and getting what you need really and we don't need to be bound by the natal chart however it's really important to note that sometimes working out what we need as opposed to what we want is the hardest thing what's the best thing for us at that time sometimes the things that you think you want are not what you need and it's only through the course of time that we actually see in retrospect that bad thing that happened to us that loss of that job, for instance, was actually a really great thing and it led to something really positive. I saw a bumper sticker the other day that made me laugh on this subject because it said, sometimes God will give you exactly what you wanted just to show you it's not at all what you needed. There's a good exercise Caitlin Kopic discusses on this topic where you can kind of examine what you need look at what your goals are long term short term and then you'd see how they fit into the different houses on your chart and then you can use a point system where you'd work out which planets have strongest existing and which need boosting in order to attain goals or work towards developing a skill set where you might get closer to attain that goal ultimately it's also about learning to see all aspects of ourselves and also learning to love each aspect of ourselves, the good and the bad, as being all expressions of that divine spark. As the great magician Eliphas Levi wrote, when we love, we see the infinite in the finite, we find the creator in the creation. That's all we've got time for now. I hope this has been an interesting episode. We have lots of new episodes coming up over the year, including more stuff on talismanic magic. So stay tuned if you are enjoying it. And as always, thank you so much for all your support. To finish, I'd like to read a poem by C.S. Lewis titled Hesperus about the evening star Venus. Through the starry hollow of the summer night, I would follow, follow Hesperus the bright to seek beyond the western wave his garden of delight. Hesperus, the fairest of all gods that are, peace and dreams thou bearest in thy shadowy car. And often in my evening walks I've blessed thee from afar. Stars without number dust the noon of night, thou the early slumber and still the light. Of the gentle twilight hours rulest in thy right, when the pale skies shiver seeing night is done past the ocean river lightly thou dost run to look for pleasant sleepy lands that never fear the sun where beyond the waters of the outer sea thy triple crown of daughters that guards the golden tree 
Sing out across the lonely tide a welcome home to thee. And while the old, old dragon for joy lifts up his head, they bring thee forth a flagon of nectar foaming red. And underneath the drowsy trees of poppies strew thy bed. Ah, that I could follow in thy footsteps bright through the starry hollow of the summer night, sloping down the western ways to find my heart's delight. Thanks very much for joining us this week on the Occult London podcast. Hope you've enjoyed it. Please make sure to visit our website at occultlondon.co.uk where you can subscribe to the show. Thank you and good night. <laughs>